Hello and welcome to the third instalment of our Kipco British Champion Series programming where we are dusting off our top hats in preparation for five sensational days racing at Royal Ascot. We are graced with eight British Champion Series races at Royal Ascot and they are as follows. The Queen Anne Stakes, the King's Stand Stakes, the St James's Palace Stakes, the Prince of Wales' Stakes, the Gold Cup, the Commonwealth Cup, the Coronation Stakes, and of course, culminating with Saturday's Diamond Jubilee Stakes. We'll be looking ahead to all of those races with the man to my left, who is, of course, Chris Dixon. Talking about all those races with him very shortly, and we will be hearing from some top connections as well. It's a good position to be in, but every time I see the bet, and he's even money favourite, but I suppose his performance in the lock was, was good, and we're, we're very happy with him, you know? He seems in as good a form as ever. Um, he's really expressive, he's really, really well. Um, my head man rides him every day, and he's happy with him, and that's good enough for me. When you have a sound horse that's as great as she is and as fit as she is and she's traveled over well, you know, what more could you ask? So much to look forward to then across five excellent days of racing at Royal Ascot. And as I've said, the man to my left is Chris Dixon. Looking forward to the eight British Champion Series races. Chris, we've enjoyed looking ahead to the first British Classics of the season. We've, we've taken those in and now we get a plethora of br brilliant races from Royal Ascot. What, what does Royal Ascot mean to you with those eight races, British Champion Series races, stretched across five days? Well, it's just all quality, isn't it? And it's not just the Champion Series races. Obviously, they're the highlight, but we've got those two-year-old races as well, which will, will be the horses that we will be focusing on this time next year for those Champion Series races. The handicaps are fantastic, and they can even, on occasions, throw future top-level performers. So... It's really competitive, it's an excellent week of racing and it, it just brings together everything that's great about British racing in many ways. Do you like wearing a top hat? Not especially, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll deal with it for the pleasure of being able to go and watch, uh, watch these top quality horses. Absolutely. It, it's always fun to get dressed up for the races and that is exactly what we have to do for Royal Ascot. Right, uh, let's kick off with looking ahead to our first race of the meeting. The very best place to start with our race analysis is the first race of the meeting. It is the Queen Anne Stakes. It's a Group 1 contest over a mile. And one of the key bits of form for that race is the Al Shakab lock injury. So the race we're going to take in now. Highlight Toscanini, pacemaker for Ribchester. Well, he did the reverse of that, and Ribchester was left to his own devices up top. He took them along, Chris, and that was where he stayed. Although there is a slight caveat to that. As much as saying he stayed there, he did end up coming right the way across the track to the stand side rail but it didn't inconvenience him for all it didn't go to plan at the start it went to plan throughout the race Chris yeah and, and that start was crucial because what it meant was that there was a change in tactics for Ribchester that I don't think that they've necessarily planned on he'd not made the running in the past but he did here and I think these two horses that we've got here Ribchester and Lightning Spear they are the key contenders for the Queen Anne the betting is going to say as much as well They've met on a few occasions. I think on his last four runs, Lightning Spear has come up against Rib Ribchester and he's yet to finish in front of him. Mm, yeah, of course, they bumped into each other on QE2 day at the back end of, of last year on Kipco British Champions Day. What chance does he have of reversing the form on better ground? Is that going to be key to him or is that likely to help Ribchester as well? Well, the chances are that Ribchester will do the job on him again and get the better of him, but the prices are probably a little bit too far apart for my liking. I, I think... On that occasion in the lock-inch, um, obviously Ribchester had a run. He'd run over in Dubai already, so he was race fit. Lightning Spear wasn't. I think maybe a true representation of the relative merits of the two horses could be Kipco British Champions Day and the QE2 last year. On that occasion, there wasn't that much between the pair of them, and that was despite Lightning Spear potentially racing on the wrong part of the track. So at the prices, I'm going to go for Lightning Spear. And there was a, a, a caveat to that race in that Toscanini missed the break. He was the apparent pacemaker. Now, Sheikh Farhad may well run Dutch Uncle, a new acquisition for, for the team, to be a pacemaker for Lightning Spear. Yeah. Does that actually play into the hands of Ribchester? Will he be better off a, off a, a stronger pace, off another horse as well? Well, he might be. Um, I, the, the evidence so far suggests that Ribchester is a little bit better than Lightning Spear. He is the most likely winner of the race. The prices say as much. As I say, at the odds, I'm going to go with Lightning Spear, maybe win and place, but the chances are that Ribchester will, will win again. Uh, they are, are the chances, as far as uh, Chris is concerned, or likeliest winner is Ribchester. And we can hear from his trainer, Richard Fahey, now. 
So Richard, the Queen Anne, Royal Ascot burst into life and big race for you with Ribchester. Yeah, look, it's uh, it's it's a good position to be in. But every time I see the betting, he's even money favourite. But I suppose his performance in the Lockinge was was good, and we're, we're very happy with him, you know. And his performance in Lockinge proved that he's not one-dimensional tactics. You know, he yeah. can make the run, and he can drop in ground. Seems to come alight. So yes, probably the signs of a very good horse. He can do anything. Um, as he's matured mentally, he's he's become more flexible. Uh, I mean, I don't think people are giving William the credit. He, he, he rides him extremely well. Um, you know, as I've been quoted before, he's a sort of horse that can, you know, he's, he's, he's got a Ferrari engine. He can go from not to 35 and five strides. Time to turn our attention to the sprinters now. And we're going to preview the King's Stand. The key bit of form with regard to that we're going to look at came in the Palace House Stakes. We'll actually just highlight where they are here. That is the winner. That is Marsha, who comes from a little bit further back, and she was giving weight away here. If we roll it on, Chris. Well, this was there's, a... the, there's the second, so we know it is Washington, D.C. Yep. Um, and we've got other horses in behind. Priceless, who's come out and won since, and Gold Dream, a previous winner of the King's Stand, in here as well. So a really solid piece of form. Marsha carrying the penalty here for last year's win in the Abbey and gets the better of Washington, D.C. in a tight finish. Washington, D.C., already up to speed, already race fit. Marsha, first start of the season for her. And come Royal Ascot and the King's Stand, she will be better off at the weights than she was with Washington, D.C. So really, not too many reasons to think that she won't confirm that form. Absolutely. She'll be getting three pounds from the Colts in the, the King's Stand itself. She will have to give a bit of weight away, though, to a, to a certain three-year-old in the form of Lady Aurelia. We'll come to her. Uh, we should also touch upon Gold Dream here in the, the yellow and black colours. He's a horse that knows how to win the race we're looking ahead to, the King Stand. He won it two years ago, Chris. He did. Um, he's since been behind Priceless, who was just in behind there in fourth or fifth spot um, when the pair of them ran in the Temple Stakes next time. So that form has been reversed around. But as you say, he's got that Ascot form and he's trained by a, a sprinting king as well. So um, every chance that he goes very well. But I think that Marsha is just a lightly raced horse who's really progressing. And, and she's the one that they've all got to beat, I think, at a track that I expect will suit her. And for all she, she won in France at the back end, it wasn't very testing ground in France. What she's shown, and we're looking ahead to a meeting that's likely to be run on pretty quick ground, certainly for the start of the meeting, she's shown that she really handles a, a pretty quick surface. Yeah, she does. And um, as I say, she's very lightly raced and there could be some more improvement in her, particularly when you consider that the figures say that she's run career bests on her last two starts. And that weight carrying performance there, get, carrying the penalty was a, a really impressive display. You've mentioned there Lady Aurelia, so impressive at the Royal Meeting last year. They rode her differently on a recent return to action at Keeneland, and that could be key because for all that she blitzed the field last year against the two-year-olds, I think that will be much harder to do in this race, particularly in a contest where there are other speed horses there. I think that if they try and gun her from the front, then something might come and pick her off. Her chances will be enhanced, in my opinion, if she's ridden like she was at Keeneland. And what she had as a, a juvenile over the minimum was she found when, when challenging over here and in France when she ran, there was nothing else that could go as quick as her. Mm. But against these older seasoned Colts over this five furlongs, do you think something else might be able to just take her along? She won't be able to blitz them from the front. I, I think so. And I, I think in this race, it would be very hard to blitz them from the front. So for all that she's got a very good chance, I, I'm happy enough to take her on. And I think that Marsha, another filly, could be the one to side with. Well, Wesley Ward has talked about having his strongest team going forward to Royal Ascot ever. And as mentioned, he saddles Lady Aurelia here. Wesley, is this the best that you've ever had her? Well, you know, obviously you want to see them come back at three as they are at two, and I think she did that in her comeback in the Giants Causeway at Keeneland. Uh, she, she had a new tactic to where she sat behind. She rated very kindly for John Velasquez. When he eased her out, she exploded. And she ran big figures that we have in the States. Um, and I gave her a little bit of time to get over that. And coming back, all of her works have been fantastic. She's extremely sound. You know, in all of her endoscopic examinations after the breezes, there's, there's no blood at all. Uh, so the bleeding is, is, is certainly not going to be a, a, we have that under control now. Um, when you have a sound horse that's as great as she is and as fit as she is and she's traveled over well, you know, what more could you ask? Time to have a look at the three-year-olds now in the St. James's Palace Stakes. We're over a mile. We saw plenty of them in the Kipco 2000 Guineas. 
and we're going to see plenty of them again here. That is the form line we're going to have a look at, the 2,000 guineas. We roll it along, Chris. At this stage, they're all in one nice, happy group. But very soon that starts to change. Yeah, a cutaway was in place at Newmarket, uh, as is the, the thing now at the Guineas meeting. And, and the race soon, soon does start to change. And we can see why. Here's Churchill on the near side. And he gets a nice clear yeah. passage through. Let's He's just, the eventual winner. That's, that's Churchill. We'll highlight him here. Now, what happens is this horse, the apparent third string of the Coolmore Massive, starts to move out towards the centre of the track. And it does, this boy here, Barney Roy absolutely no favours whatsoever. Yeah, and it, it does just ensure that he doesn't get the best of runs through, whereas Churchill, who's kind of committed at that point, does start to um, get a, a clear passage. He's, he's out in the clear already. Here it is, where he just gets unbalanced on the track as well, so maybe the downhill element of the track wasn't ideal for him. There's the horses that are bunching around him, they're making life much more difficult than for Churchill, who's got a nice rail to run against, a clear passage, plenty of daylight, and he's already rolling. Now, Churchill would probably have won anyway, yeah. but I think that Barney Roy would have been closer. And on a more conventional track, there is a chance that he manages to reverse the form. The other factors to take into account, that was Barney Roy's third start of his life. And Churchill was a more battle-hardened performer already. So there is an element of he could still be open to even more improvement, Barney Roy. So it could be a really good matchup between the two. And two other Barney Roy factors to take into account. He took a, a full step in the dip, as you say. He didn't really seem to handle the track. A more conventional Ascot might just suit him that bit better. Also, they didn't go very fast there. That seemed to help Churchill, whereas Barney Roy couldn't really quicken into and out of that dip. Might they employ similar tactics going forward to a St James's Palace? Aidan O'Brien... Has, is likely to go to war with four or five in this. Yeah. And, and might they just employ those slowing tactics to help Churchill here? Will that not suit Barney Roy? Well, it probably wouldn't. And let's think back to last year in the Royal Meeting and Galileo Gold, who uh, managed to, to win this race under a fantastic tactical ride by Dottori. And tactics can play a big part. And as you say, Edna O'Brien, with all the quality that he's got, might be best placed to be able to manipulate the race to some degree to suit Churchill and perhaps not Barney Roy. In terms of ability, on what we've seen so far, Churchill is the better horse just, but Barney Roy isn't that far behind and he is open to improvement. It should be a great race. I'll look at the Prince of Wales' stakes next. We're over 10 furlongs here, but we're going to have a look, as far as a key bit of form, at a race over a mile and a half. That came in Dubai and it was the Shima Classic. It was won by Jack Hobbs, who may well drop back in trip on the back of this and contest the Prince of Wales over a two furlongs shorter. The first thing to say about this horse, with a semi blinkers on, Chris, just keeping him nice and straightforward. He travelled like a dream throughout the race and he extended away like a seriously good horse. He did, and dropping out the bat there in the uh, purple Cornwall colours is uh, Highland Reel, who hopefully is going to take his chance in this. He does have other options as well. He was unsuited by the ground on this occasion in Dubai, good to soft ground that night. He's since back on a fast surface, come out and won in tidy style at Epsom. But this horse, he hasn't stood as much racing as Connections would have probably liked in recent times. But we know that on his, on his day, he is a real high-class performer. He had a, an injury. He's a fragile horse to an extent as well. Now, what we saw there, the ground, it was juicy enough because they'd had a whole host of rain out in Dubai and lead up to World Cup night. Would seriously quick ground over 10 furlongs be a worry for you for Jack Hobbs? I think he'd be all right, but it, it, he, he might be better under that specific set of circumstances over a little bit further. But it's a stiff enough track. I'm sure he'd be OK. And interesting, William Buick, since um, that, um, that race in Dubai, has said that in the build-up to Royal Ascot that he would prefer to run in this race. And it looks like that's the option that they're going to take. He thinks that with the headgear on... He travels better yes. and that this could be his trip. And the last time he ran over the course and distance of the Prince of Wales estates, he was beaten on Kipco British Champions Day itself. He didn't have a good draw on the day and, and he had to do a little bit early. But also, as you say, John Goldston mentioned the fact that he had a good old look around. The headgear might have just sorted that out for him. Yeah, exactly. So he's definitely a, an interesting contender. I hope that Highland Real takes his chance because on really fast ground, he would be a, a massive mm. player. We know that he's high quality five times He's a winner at the highest level now following that win in the Coronation Cup at, um, at uh, Epsom. Yeah, we're talking about two horses here in the form of Highland Real possibly running out and, and Jack Hobbs who have shown their best form over a mile and a half. Mm. But we've got a contender in the form of Ulysses who's probably shown his best form over the 10 furlongs itself and he is an improving horse. 
Yeah, I think that's the key point. He's probably a horse that hasn't shown his best form yet. The other two might have done. They're, they're probably at their level. They're high-class, proven, top-level performers. But all you see is, has still got the potential to get better, and he's not that far behind them. I thought he did very well to win at Sandown on his most recent start. He overcame the, the race tempo in many ways uh, on that occasion. The horse that he beat, Doville, has come out and won at Chester in group company since. He's finished placed, running a good third in a group one over in Ireland since as well. Uh, he had last year's winner of this race back in third in my dream boat on that occasion. So it looks like a really strong piece of form. It was his first start of the season, and I think it was the eighth start of his life. He really is going the right way. He's always had a big reputation, and he's in a stable that just gets steady improvement out their horses. Mm, it, it could be, it should be, a fascinating Prince of Wales' stakes coming up on the Wednesday of Royal Ascot.